Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome from a rather glorious evening in London. And I hope uh, the sky is clear wherever you are. And I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. Um, I am delighted, as per every Tuesday, to welcome you to another session of the SOAS Middle East Institute Tuesday evening lectures. As you know by now that um, myself, Nargis Farzad, and my colleague, Dr. Dina Massa, the chair of uh, Center for Palestinian Studies, organized these um, uh, Tuesday evening lectures. And one of the joys, if I can call that, uh, of lockdown has been an amazing, Dina John is here, fantastic Dina, we've only just started. I was going to make apologies that you'll be uh, 10 minutes running between digital meetings. One of the wonderful things about lockdown is foreign correspondents are grounded and no longer dashing to the airport just with a camera and their passport to zoom from one battlefield to the next revolution. It is such a pleasure on your behalf and of course myself and Dina to welcome Scott Peterson who we've been trying to nab for a little while at the moment, but there is always a uprising or a natural disaster or a meltdown in the Middle East, if not Africa, for him to cover. Scott Peterson, as I have introduced him, um, uh, is a foreign correspondent and of course a bureau chief who has most of his career, Scott can correct me, has been writing for the Christian Science Monitor. He has been based in several places, I think uh, too long to list, but certainly in the Middle East, in Russia, if I'm, am I correct, in Moscow? That's right. And um, in Istanbul before moving to London. He has, you name it, he has covered it. Uh, in mostly in the Middle East, and in Africa, and I think a few other meltdown spots in uh, Eastern and Central Europe and more. And as if that wasn't enough, as if covering revolutions and dodging bullets and remembering where to put his foot down between the mines wasn't enough, for relaxation, he does extreme rock climbing. So maybe we can visit that. Scott Peterson, very welcome to SOAS Online, the digital world. I'm sorry that we can't host you at our lovely campus, but we look forward to do that next time. Uh, Scott is also a phenomenally good uh, photographer as well. And um, his uh, photographs are, um, I, I, I think, hosted by the Getty Images. And um, he's also the author of two books. It's millions of articles. In fact, I was just reading your last article. I think I can't keep up, but I think it was about the 10th anniversary of the uprising in Syria, wasn't it, Scott? And the two books, one, uh, Me Against My Brother, which is about uh, in Africa, the Somali, and the book, which obviously I have on my bookshelf, is about Iran, all written almost 11 years ago. And I was just opening that book and I'll have to show off that I have it here. And it so Scott starts by saying that no other country so dominates the headlines. Iran is portrayed as et cetera, et cetera. And that was 11 years ago. And I don't think Iran has been off the front pages since then. So you're not here to hear me um, go on and on. Um, but I uh, welcome you to uh, uh, hear Scott's illustrated talk, which we've entitled Iran 25 years, 45 visits, and a journey behind the headlines. And I am delighted that it is going to be an illustrated talk so we can enjoy his lovely photographs. So Scott, the Zoom, the screen is yours. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Nargez Jun, and also Dina Jun and Aki Jan for organizing this and also for inviting me uh, to SOAS, to your Middle East Institute, and also to the Center uh, for Iranian Studies. 
at SOAS. I'm really grateful to, to uh, well, that you finally nabbed me, as you say, uh, for one of these Tuesday night lectures. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward, looking forward to it. Um, you know, all of us in the, in the past year have had a lot more time to, well, be at home, grounded, as you say. So this is the, this is the longest period of time in my entire career um, that I have not traveled anywhere probably by a factor of about five or six. Um, this really has been a very long time. So in the process, um, that has meant some pretty much deep cleaning of files and, and things like that. And of course, I have tossed out mountains of documentation and files and things that have been piling up over the years from Iran and, and from every country that I, that I cover. And one of the things I came across uh, from Iran, and I just wanted to show this to you, this is an 86-page contact list, which I had compiled over the first 30 visits that I made to Iran. And so I didn't toss it, actually, it was the last hard copy. But it is literally 86 pages of single space typed text. And this is everything you can imagine. This is basically a template of the kind of social and political fabric of Iran in the sense that I've included obviously contacts and things like that, their phone numbers, even to be honest, their addresses. So if I've seen them at home, like even their little couche is marked down. I mean, what floor they're on, their home numbers and all sorts of things to try and find people again. Because I mean, you know, Iran is such a crazy place. Tehran is such a crazy city that trying to get around and finding things is not so easy. So, so anyway, I've, I, I came across this and what really struck me when I started to go through it was how many of these themes that were active then, again, this is 86 pages, only up to 2009. So it's, you know, and many of the themes are, are the same things that we're writing about today every single day. So we're looking at like, you know, the kind of the fluctuating US-Iran hostility um, that goes on so much history involved there. We've got the roller coaster of the Iran nuclear issue, which again, just, you know, the, some of the issues that were dealt with back then are still coming up. And of course, we have the ongoing and permanent theme of how Iranians themselves cope with the Islamic Republic, with the regime, with just the situation that they find themselves in every single day. And of course, those are the kind of stories that as a journalist, I'm, I'm most interested in, um, you know, in finding. So, so anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few slides while I make some introductory remarks, and I'm going to read to you a few gems that I came across from inside here while I'm showing you those, while I'm showing you those images, because, you know, it just, it just really takes you back to some of the, the things that have sparked, um, you know, over the course of the years. And, you know, what's remarkable about Iran, and one, you know, I'm glad you held up a copy of my book, Nargesya, and that was very, very kind of you, because, but that book is 732 pages. It has 1,300 endnotes. And I would certainly suggest to anyone considering writing a book that you maybe cut all that in half at the very most. But on Iran, you really can't do justice to this subject and to the voices of the people you speak to and, and everything else without a volume this large. You almost feel like you'd be doing a disservice producing a 100 page, page book. Anyway, let me go on to, let me share my screen here. I'm gonna just go through some of these images <clears throat> without commentary, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna read some of the, kind of some of the gems that have, that have come up from this, um, that have come up from this uh, uh, contact list. For example, we have from early days of the revolution, we have Ayatollah Beheshti with this remarkable comment that let the Americans be angry and let them die of their anger. So this is such an incredible put down in Persian that's really effective. I mean, in English, I wish we, sometimes I wish we had such, such put downs, but this one is actually painted on the walls um, uh, of some buildings in Tehran. Um, and it's also just a, you know, kind of, it, it just popped out as, as uh, something that still is in the, um, you know, on the tips of the tongues of some more hardline leaders um, in Iran uh, these days. We also have another one, which I was really surprised when I came across this. Um, there's a quote from the Associated Press in this. Again, I keep quotes and other various little snippets to kind of remind me of the context of where these things have come from. So I'm quoting the Associated Press here. 
Jane's Defense Weekly in 1984 predicted that Iran would have a nuclear bomb in two years. That was 1984, just five years into the revolution. Now, of course, as we know, we've had these predictions again and again, coming from the Americans, coming from the Iraqis, coming from the Israelis, especially. Two years time, three years time, five years time. I was amazed to go back and find that as early as 1984, you had this prediction. Now, of course, if that really was what Iran's aim was to go for a nuclear weapon, then I think that we could safely say that this was the least efficient weapons program for a nuclear bomb in the history of mankind, because every other nation has managed it much faster than 35 years um, that's actually gone for it. So anyway, that one struck me uh, very much. Another one, <clears throat> there was a extraordinary character uh, during the uh, period of, of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, and his name was Mehdi Kalhor. He was this kind of like long haired cultural advisor. This is how he cast himself. And just before that election where an arch conservative Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was going to be, was going to be um, elected for the first time in 2005, Mehdi Kalhor began an earthquake in politics. Just a couple of days before the vote, he gave an interview in which he said, <clears throat> He said, first of all, he, he was criticizing, he was criticizing the Islamic guidance ministry for being very tough on musicians because they couldn't show instruments on television. It was against the law to show instruments on television. He said, where else in the world do people behave like this? We have to export our music to the world. Our income from our music could be more than our income from oil. You see why this guy's on the edge of crazy. Our pop and even rock music has room to make progress, we have to make more space. Of course, he's appealing to all of those undecided voters, those many, many more reformist and centrist voters who would never normally think about voting for an arch conservative like uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. So here's, the, here's the, the kicker on that line from Mehdi Kalhor. He said, Mr. Ahmadinejad, he wants everyone to be joyful. At the moment, we think people do not laugh from their heart. We want them to be happy from inside. Anyway, very surprising. Of course, he was elected. He ended up serving two terms. And um, I think the term security crackdown is uh, one that's uh, frequently um, associated with him. And of course, that is one of the terms that comes up in this vast document um, as I go through. In fact, all sorts of the kind of terms that are still in play and active today have been active for decades. I mean, there are warnings of like the security outlook, infiltrators, watch out for the no fuzi. And this is like 30 years ago, but these are the same charges and accusations that are being applied to, to people um, you know, these days as well. Warnings about psychological war, warnings about covert war. Of course, there were a number of, um, of Iranian nuclear scientists that were assassinated on the streets of Tehran. Um, so, and, and, and many other, aspects of the nuclear uh, program were targeted. And then also, of course, the creeping coup in the press, be warned. Now, of course, that one actually brings me to, <clears throat> to a, um, a remarkable article uh, that I also have, have uh, plucked out here from 2007. And it's from Siasate Ruz, which is a hardline daily newspaper. And this is one that essentially, I had been making efforts for many years to visit the Iran-Iraq border down in the southwest corner, one of the main Iran-Iraq battlefields. And this is an area that's very particular to, you know, those who are kind of true believers, more ideological um, in Iran. They're those who embrace the ideals of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, they're the ones who, who, you know, kind of buy into this idea that, uh, you know, that this was a divine and sacred defense and you know, and that the war itself was a sacred, sacred enterprise. So I was always interested in getting down into that area because I know that, that there are busloads of, of um, students that are taken down there and other people who are interested. And they're taken to the Gulf War battlefields. They're taken to the areas, especially where there were large battles where Iran lost a lot of martyrs. And what's important about those places is that 
the students, and I'd seen pictures of this, and this is what I wanted to photograph myself. I saw pictures of you know, students literally scooping up bits of the sand, parts of the soils to put into Ziploc bags because that soil had been drenched with the blood of the martyrs. That was their whole point about that. And they have a name for this. It's called Rahayana Nur. Um, and it's the, um, it's the uh, followers of the light. And that's, it's just kind of a, a way of passing on the torch from one generation to the next. So I always wanted to go do that. And I basically never got approval after nine, 10 years of trying every single year because it's seasonal. It's happening in fact right now, just before Noru's. And um, so basically, Siasate Ruse, when they heard that I had been shut down by the, by the Brigadier General, who's in charge of the memory of the sacred defense, he said, oh, I mean, he, he'd actually made a press statement in which he said, A. Scott Daniel Peterson will not be going down to the border areas because whatever, it's sensitive or you know whatever he said. Siasate Ruse put a much darker twist on it. And it said, dispatching journalists to the border can only be described as a cover-up when the enemy is expanding the range of its threats and propaganda constantly, it said. And then the twist, there is no doubt that those who've been appointed by this for this mission by America are among the most experienced spies of the CIA who are responsible for evaluating the potential of our country's military arrangements. Anyway, of course, when I saw that, I asked my translator, we've got to find this guy. Who wrote this thing? We need to talk to him. So there's a certain Mr. Azizi, and if he exists, I'll eat my computer. Of course, he doesn't exist. But Mr. Azizi penned this, penned this piece. Anyway, so, but that's it. I just, I feel fairly honored, to be honest, to be uh, targeted with, with that sort of thing, because there are so many politicians and many others um, in Iran who, of course, have been similarly accused. Um, you know, of such things. And it just, it goes into everybody's files, it goes into my files. Um, so anyway, it's, um, it's just something, it's just kind of par for the course, par for, for the course in Iran sometimes. Anyway, that brought back um, memories of a lot of those journeys because every single one of those contacts, everything else is dated, how often I would visit people and, and things like that. And one thing I should say at the outset is that I have made 45 trips to Iran over these last 25 years. But one thing that you should know is that none of these visas, except for two, came easily. So everyone was some kind of a bureaucratic battle. Every single one required back and forth and back and forth. So it wasn't like they were just churning them out. Um, I mean, it's so, and it was just, my editors were interested at the monitor. I was interested in Iran. And I mean, I traveled to a lot of different countries. I've traveled even more to Iraq, for example, during the war, um, you know, endlessly and, uh, and to a lot of other countries. But Iran always had a special, um, had a special interest and it's, you know, the paradoxes that are inbuilt, the contradictions, the things that, I mean, as you can see from these photographs, just for example, I mean, you have incredibly westernized scenes like this one you know, like this one, and then you've got other ones that are a much more, um, you know, kind of ideological bent, the things that we're much more used to seeing, burning flags and, and uh, things like that, which again, you know, so many Iranians will tell you, why do you portray us with, a, you know, with a burning flag, which, and they're right, there's only a handful of times a year when that even happens, and there are only a handful of people out of the 85 million Iranians there are, you know, that actually take part in that. So, of course, you know, as a journalist, one's trying to, to reflect the, um, you know, the realities of this, for example, Valentine's Day in Qom, which is one of the most sacred cities and religious cities in the entire in the entire country. So the challenge for the journalist is really to get behind that kind of flag burning rhetoric, um, you know. And in fact, I mean, I've seen so many flags, you know, burned in in, in Iran and during various events that um, you know that I used to actually call it the flag burning metric. So how flags were burned, how large they were, how many they were, how angry people appeared to be, um, you know, in the course of their, uh, in, in terms of their, their flag burning. But in fact, you know, my job should be to, and it has been, and I've taken this on as, as my job, to, to basically portray the human voices um, that, are, that are among those 85 million Iranians. And, you know, I've written about everything from paintball and nose jobs and vasectomies 
to Revolutionary Guard funerals, um, you know, and the capture by Iran of the CIA's stealth drone. That was a project that the United States, the Pentagon had never even admitted existed. And then Iran managed to bring one down largely intact out of the sky. So, you know, there's just such an incredible um, spectrum of, of stories and, and things that, um, you know, and things that, uh, you know, to report about as a journalist, but the, you know, but the real trick is to try and bring that, that human voice. So, so that's bringing me to what I'm hoping to do today. And that is to tell some of the stories that have affected me most. These are human stories among all the many stories. I mean, I must say, I, I haven't exactly written zillions of stories as Nargis Junes just said, um, however, um, it is a very, very sizable number that's just a little bit short of zillions. And among those, <clears throat> among those are stories that, again, span this, the political spectrum. And I'll just say one thing about my access inside Iran. It was a lot broader prior to the protest movement, the Green Movement of 2009. After that, there was a much greater securitization that took place. So a lot of my interviews with more hardline or true believing or more conservative elements of society took place prior to 2009. And in those days, people would speak to an American journalist. Well, why would people speak to an American journalist in Iran, considering all the rhetoric uh, that goes, you know, back and forth and the, you know, the, the, the real bileful, um, you know, accusations and, and things like that. And part of it is because people want to get their voice out. And if they see a foreign journalist, they're going to you know, they're going to invite them in for tea and, and try and get their try and get their voice out there. And personally, I have never felt anything but warmth from Iranians when I was there. And even more warmth, actually, when I noted that I was an American and they said, wow, because I mean, in Iran, that's like being a unicorn. I mean, there are not many <laughs> Americans who are around. So people, you know, you can walk into an auditorium and, if, and then it just well, it's like silence because no one's seen anything like this in their midst. Um, in fact, so anyway, as I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> I was especially interested in getting down to that border area, partly because I wanted to see how the ideologues of the regime passed on the torch from father to son. How is it that they pass on this commitment to the revolution, this commitment as they see it to, you know, the teachings of Imam Hussein and all of this, all of this kind of stuff. So I didn't get down to the border, but I did get approved to visit a place called Ahvaz and Desful down on the border, which was very, very close. Um, and in fact, those were cities that were hit by Saddam Hussein's missiles constantly. So there are a lot of places to go and a lot of people who experienced the war there. And so what I did was, because I wasn't able to actually get into the, um, into the actual uh, battlefield areas, I decided with my translator that we would go to the cemeteries of Ahvaz and Dezhul, where we would try to find people who'd been affected and hopefully try and find evidence of this passage, passing of the, of the torch. Of course, you know, these martyr cemeteries are all over Iran. There's a huge one south of, south of Tehran. Um, this one is in Ahvaz. Um, this is a very common type of um, type of uh, uh, funeral stone as well for the um, Shahid de Gomnam. This is a um, you know basically an unknown soldier, and there's so many of them who who were buried there as well. And and um, these are the type of of images you see. Now this is the man who mattered most when I met him. This is the son. His name is um, Ali Akbar Khoshnavar, and he is next to the grave of the man that he's named after. So I basically just with my translator, we went into this into the cemetery and we found this guy He was on the verge of cleaning, you can see the bottle of water. He's on the verge of cleaning that, that gravestone. And we started to speak to him. And he said, Oh, yeah, my father is, you know, my father, I'm named after, you know, this martyr and, and he was, you know, close to my father during the war. I said, Well, please let me could we meet your father. So that night, we went to meet his father. And his father is a man who has a large print factory, but he's someone who also was very badly wounded in the war. So to start with, he's a true believer. This is, there's no question about that. 
And we're sitting there, we're drinking tea. He's reminding me that Ayatollah Khomeini said that the, said that the Islamic Republic is irrigated with the blood of the martyrs. And he had as a red memory book, in fact, one that, I mean, he also, had, this man also has PTSD. Um, he threw that book in the Karun River, which runs through Ahvaz. And, um, and basically his son went in to fish it out and he was showing me pictures of this like kind of water stained images from the war. And he said, this one's dead. He's pointing out his colleagues, comrades. He said, this one's dead, that one's dead, this one's dead. And then he turns the page and he gets to a coin that shows a picture of Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And he said, this is like, this is my most treasured possession. And he says that it had literally come directly from Ayatollah Khomeini to his commander and was given to him. And for him, this is like about as close to the divine as you can get as far as he is, as far as he is concerned. But this is a guy who truly embraced and loved the war that he fought in. I mean, I was shocked when he pulled up his shirt for me and showed his back lacerated with scars, scar tissue. I mean, he'd obviously been in a number of blasts and his, you know, his legs were, his legs were wounded, so he was limping. And he actually officially came within 5% of death is like the official figure that they gave me for, for, what, that, for what that meant. And he said, and these are, these are uh, his words, he said, in our generation, we wouldn't allow ourselves to be hospitalized. We would go back to the war as soon as we could walk. That's one thing. The second thing is when I said, so tell me about it. Those, tell me more about the war. And he said, it's hard to describe unless you were there. He said, no matter how many times I tell you that this is cold, and he literally put his finger on the edge of the carpet that we were sitting on, put it on the cold concrete floor. He said, no matter how many times I tell you this is cold, you won't understand it until you touch it. And that was exactly the case. And here, in fact, was an example of how in this family, because the son was a, absolutely a true believer as well. And here was evidence of how it is that this, you know, the ideolo ideology that had begun with that revolution has been passed on, is passed on in some places, among some in, um, in, uh, from father to son. So interestingly enough, that passage and that whole concept is something that is fairly exclusive or seen as fairly exclusive by those who hold it. And I'm, I'll give you an example, which really struck me because you know, this, is, this is kind of gets to some of the divisions, some of the social divisions inside Iran and people's attitudes toward the revolution and, and toward the Islamic Republic. And that is, the, and, and that is the difference between a chodi, someone who's an insider like these believers I've just described to you, or a gera chodi, who is a, an outsider. And to give you an idea about how those worlds don't mesh too easily, I'm reminded of a, of a scene that took place in Behesht Zara Cemetery. And this is the large martyr cemetery, not martyr cemetery, it's, a, it's for everybody, um, south of Tehran. And, and back during the war, they used to have fountains that literally like had red water. It was like, you know, painted red um, or dyed red so that it would, that it would flow, flow out. And um, yeah, a friend of mine who is a, um, who's a westernized lady went there in an effort to bridge the gap. She appreciated and said she'd appreciated what the, you know, what the, um, uh, you know, what the martyrs had, had, had sacrificed. And so she's immediately confronted by a hostile believer who said, what are you doing here with that head job? Meaning he could tell that she was, you know, kind of a, a you know, westernized lady and not someone who, you know, looked like most of the people that he knew with a much more black shador and, and all of that. And um, so, and she said, well, I'm, I'm just trying to pay my respects. I want to put some flowers on the graves of those martyrs who, uh, who died, in, died in the war. And his response was so dismissive. And he just said, they didn't die for people like you. Anyway, just a kind of, you know a little insight into into how that division affects um, affects society, and it's one of the reasons. It's one of the many many fault lines that that uh, you know that kind of crisscross um, Iran. So, I want to tell another story about another remarkable. Um, <laughs> left the slides sitting there. I'm just going to move along. These are still in the uh, in the cemetery in Ahvaz.
and this is Ali Akbar uh, Khoshnavar um, at his uh, namesake's grave. So during, during um, Mr. Ahmadinejad's presidency, I'm sure that you will remember all of the kerfuffle about the fact that he often denied the Holocaust or denied the scale of the Holocaust. And, and of course, also was quoted saying, and these are the words actually originally of Ayatollah Khomeini, saying that one day Israel will be wiped from the face of the earth. It will disappear from the face of time is actually the, the, uh, the translation. So in the course of Mr. Ahmadinejad's back and forth, um, you know, accusing Israel and doing everything else, there was a conference held in Tehran that was specifically including a bunch of, I mean, there were a number of like Holocaust deniers who were invited. David Duke of the KKK was there. I mean, it was an extraordinary gathering. Um, you know, there was a cartoon, you know, kind of an anti-Holocaust cartoon competition and, and a lot of things. And I happened to be there during that conference. And within a week or two, it turned out that I got an invitation from the, um, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And they said, we are putting together a diplomatic tour of all the Jewish sites in Tehran. And you're welcome to come. And I said, great, all right, well, I'll do that. So, the, so we, we begin, so this tour, as it transpires, so I didn't know what it, you know, what it involved or anything else. So as it transpires, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs people invited all of the diplomatic corps to go on this. So there were several buses. And we went to every single, um, we went to every single, uh, you know, kind of facility that was run by the Jewish community in the city. And um, here's a diplomat, for example, in one of the synagogues that we visited. This is also in one of the synagogues that we visited. The diplomats were given this tour and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs people basically said, look, we are, they, I mean, they quietly said, we are so embarrassed by what our president is saying about, you know, about the Holocaust and about everything else. And we wanted to reassure the Jewish community. So we went to the Jewish community and this is actually confirmed by the, the uh, leaders of the, of the Jewish community in Iran, which at that time, between 20 and 25,000 is probably a little bit lower now. Uh, but, but it is the largest Jewish community outside of Israel in the Middle East. I mean, it is sizable. Um, and so, so anyway, they said we were so mortified by this that we went to the leaders of the Jewish community and we said, we would like to facilitate something for you. You guys name the program, do whatever you want, take people wherever you want, just tell us what you want us to do and we would be happy to oblige. So that yielded this day-long you know, this uh, day-long tour. So we went to uh, Jewish schools, back to another synagogue. It was a remarkable, it was a remarkable thing, as a matter of fact. But what struck me the most, we also went to an elderly care home. And then we went to the Dr. Sapir Hospital. Now this hospital is a Jewish hospital, but it basically takes care of all Iranians, whether you're Jewish, Shia, whatever you happen to be. And it's famous in Iran as an institution because it's also, an, it's also a hospital that was there during the Shah's time before the revolution in 1979. And it refused to hand over wound, people that were wounded in the protests against the Shah. And in fact, it got such a, such a notoriety for this that, that Ayatollah Khomeini himself sent a note of gratitude after the revolution thanking the hospital for not like handing over the wounded, you know, the wounded revolutionaries. So that was the first thing. That's just part of the backstory of this hospital. But for me, what struck me the most was meeting a doctor there who was a Jewish surgeon. And his name was Homayun Mohaber. And he described for me what it was like to be a military surgeon on the front line during the Iran-Iraq war. Now, somehow he managed to escape the purges because there were purges after the revolution of Jewish officers in the, in the ranks. So he managed to escape those. Um, but in the course 
of doing his work, which this is a man who's a real nationalist because his whole point is that, you know, it doesn't matter whether I'm Jewish or I'm Shia or whatever, I am Iranian first. And that is, was his motivating factor. But I, I, I asked to speak to him separately later once I found a bit more out about a story. And so we went to his clinic and in his clinic, he had the results of 900 frontline operations. He had kept the shrapnel and the bullets that he had plucked out of the Iranian soldiers who were on the front line. 900 operations, he, had, he himself was wounded and he gave blood twice to save the lives of what almost certainly were Shia um, soldiers. I was so struck by the fact that he kept that. And he told me, he said, the Islamic Republic made very good respect for me all the time and did not care about my religion after the revolution. So like I say, he managed to escape the purges. And of course, um, Iran's Jews have had, have had a lot of problems um, up and down over the years, but this is just was a remarkable um, story that uh, it was really unexpected. Of course, Iran is full, is un full of unexpected stories, um, as you might expect, including the next one. I'm going to fast forward just a little bit to 2009. And for those who, so I, I mentioned a little bit earlier about the presidential election of 2009. This was be, ended up becoming a crucial watershed in the history of the Islamic revolution. So the Islamic Republic just turned 42 years old um, a few weeks ago. And, but still to this day, this event of 2009, because you remember President Ahmadinejad basically like was elected a second time, but wasn't elected a second time. People disputed that. Millions of Iranians said, we didn't vote for this man and we're not gonna accept it. And the green movement became, um, you know, became a huge, huge uh, protest movement. So I happened to go before the vote, a few days before the vote out to the city of Birjand, which is, I don't know, 800 miles east of, of Tehran. Um, it's way out there. And I had been to Birjand before because I went during one of the provincial trips that President Ahmadinejad himself made. And Ahmadinejad felt very much at home in Birjan because the, peop the people there voted for him in, the highest, in a higher percentage than any other city in Iran during the first election. So these are his, you know, these are his real home, home supporters, his home base. So it was a real surprise when I traveled to Birjan within 30 minutes by pure chance, the main challenger Mir Hossein Musavi happens to touch down in Birjand. And his staff people told us later, he said, they said, you know, we weren't even going to come here, but we've had such a surge of interest around the country that we're actually now going to these places, which are kind of strongholds of the, you know, of the, um, you know, of Ahmadinejad and, and these guys, because we think we have a chance. So, I mean, you know, who knew what to think? Within 30 minutes of arriving in that city, there was pandemonium. I think that this is the best term for this is probably Javgir, where an incredible excitement just like blasts out of nowhere. So first of all, you have the guy, this is the welcome, part of the welcoming committee at the airport in Birjand. And you remember, we are, eight, we are really out there. 800 miles east of Tehran is halfway to Afghanistan. And I mean, it's, <laughs> it's really out there. And uh, so this is a welcoming committee. You can see it's all about being a mem members of the green movement. Um, and uh, this is at the airport. But these, they're not just young people wearing green. I spoke to veterans, wounded veterans and others who said, wow, you know, this guy can really change things for us. I've met Ahmadinejad before. He's not making any, making any progress for us. So what happens? Musavi arrives and chaos absolutely erupts. People sacrifice two cows. They sacrifice a huge number of sheep. Of sheep. They you put the bloodied handprints on the car of Musavi as he's moving around. People are like holding up babies, hoping, for a, hoping to get a blessing from him. I mean, you wouldn't believe that this was an Ahmadinejad stronghold when this... Um, you know, when this uh, took place. So to be able to like kind of witness this as it, you know, as it went through this, 
you know, this chaos and this Jav gear excitement was, uh, was extraordinary. And also one of the things, because it took place right in the middle of an Ahmadinejad stronghold, that, um, you know, that you could easily think, wow, you know, maybe, maybe this man actually has a chance to win. And uh, this is the scene. They had a tiny little auditorium, fits like 5,000. I don't know how many people jammed in there, but the reason I show you these pictures is because we could not move. I mean, we sweat through our shirts. We, sw we sweat through everything that you can imagine. It was so hot inside there. And the energy that people had was just completely crazy. I mean, I was worried that my camera was going to stop working because there's so much, so much sweat like draining into it. So of course, one of the first words that uh, Mir Hossein Musavi, um, you know, says when he when he finally gets to the to the uh, to the podium, he says the heat in here is the heat rising toward freedom. I mean, clearly a well practiced politician. Uh, but the other thing was too is that he described uh, Ahmadinejad and his people as delusional fanatics. Now, of course, we know the way that this uh, this went, and I won't uh, I won't uh, give you too many I won't. Um, I have to give you too many details. I'm sure people remember about the protests that took place and th which continued for months. And even senior revolutionary guardsmen said that this was as close to the collapse of the Islamic Republic um, that had occurred um, since, the, since the beginning of the revolution. So that means even during the Iran-Iraq war um, during that period. Here are some of the Green Movement people beginning um, their celebrations um, in, uh, in Tehran actually. There's a shifting toward the clashes, which all began within the literally the second day after that um, after that election. And then, of course, this is the last um, press conference of um, that Ahmadinejad himself gave. So anyway, history there really is, um, you know, is is on display and and forevermore that has been called by the hardliners the moment of fitna. The moment of sedition. So if you if you these days listen to, you know, listen to Friday prayers and they start like and and one of the ayatollahs, for example, Ahmed Khatami, starts talking about oh, you know, the Doshman of Bazorg, the Americans, the Israelis, these are all enemies. When he starts talking about the fitna, his eyes bug out. He starts, I mean, it's something different, right? The other ones are just ticking boxes. Oh yes, the Americans, the Israelis. When he starts talking about the internal opposition, it's like completely a different game. So fast forward now a few years, we're going to go up to the results of the nuclear deal in 2015. So here we have incredible moment of hope. We have an incredible moment of expectation because the nuclear deal has now been, um, the nuclear deal has now been signed. And of course, this is something that President Hassan Rouhani had promised. He had promised a government of hope. People had that hope, but until this deal was signed, no one had expectations that it was really gonna, going to uh, uh, come together. So I have three images that I'm gonna share for you that I'm sharing with you from this, uh, this scene. It's, this is basically around Maidan Vanak um, in, um, in Tehran. And you know, people were absolutely celebrating. But at the same time, I was only able to get three shots because of course I got picked up uh, with my camera and everything else because one of these crowds started shouting, um, shouting that, that uh, President um, Rouhani should, should fulfill another one of his uh, promises, which was to release Mir Hossein Mousavi and Mehdi Karoubi. These are the two presidential contenders from the 2009 election, release them from house arrest because they've been under house arrest almost ever since. Um, that election. Anyway, just three pictures of that to be there. Now, of course, the story has depreciated since then. Um, even before President uh, Donald Trump withdrew from the nuclear deal in 2018, we've had huge corruption, huge mis mismanagement, which affected the economy. President Trump added more sanctions, which made things even worse. So, so really, the stories that we've mostly been been uh, writing about have recently have been much more about hopelessness, about an increasing suicide rate, about how Iran is coping or not with the COVID crisis, as every other country um, around the world is. And you know, I do wonder now whether or not we can say with as much confidence. You know, 15 years ago, we always used to say that, that Iranians were, um, were the most pro-American population in the region. 
And I'm not so sure that we can say that you know, anymore because Iranians know that, that in the course of this entire nuclear back and forth, that President Obama was the one who orchestrated you know, the most, the initially the most damaging um, sanctions. President Trump, uh, of course, pulled out and instituted a maximum pressure campaign. And for all intents and purposes, at least up until now, President Biden has essentially continued that maximum pressure campaign. They've given a few bits here and there. They've certainly said they want to get back to the nuclear deal, but this hasn't happened yet. So, so we'll see what happens. Now, because that's a fairly hopeless image that I've just shared, I'm going to give you two quick and more hopeful stories um, to sink your teeth into, which hopefully will reinvest your, um, your uh, sense of, of what Iranians can, can do and achieve in terms of, I don't know, just, just uh, fantastic uh, human and humane action. And one of them, there are two episodes especially. So one of them is from 2014, when I traveled to Maravan, and this is a small Kurdish town out on the border in the northwest of, uh, on the northwest of Iran. And there I found there a story that had already taken root in, in, um, in Iran. And there was a young boy, second grader, he was eight years old, um, young boy who had been bullied in his class because he had some kind of immunodeficiency uh, problem. And uh, so all of his hair fell out. So he was bullied. He had to go to class. He had to go through it. He really was an unhappy camper. His name is Mahan Rahani, uh, Rahimi. And his teacher, in solidarity, one day appeared in class and had shaved his own head. And this image of a teacher in solidarity, of course, it gobsmacked the other students who'd been, who'd been bullying him, but it became such a learning experience and not just for the you know not just for um for uh, for this classroom of students because this is a very very small school but they posted a, a picture on facebook that got 700 likes or sorry 7 million likes and that's out of like in a country where facebook is banned right so 7 million 7 million likes and i mean it caught the president's attention it did so all of a sudden these guys became celebrities so this tiny little barren Kurdish classroom where you can see the clock in the upper left. That's a clock where you're meant to like teach children how to tell time, but like both the hands had been torn off. I mean, there is nothing much that is in this school except the inspiration of a teacher to try and, you know, get in the way of, um, of the uh, bullying of this, um, of this child. So anyway, I went up amazing story about this, um, about this boy, about his teacher and, you know, and really, I think that um, you know something that that caught the caught the uh, imagination also of Iranians to the point where um, you know literally they issued a stamp in his um, they issued a stamp in his in his honor. It's right here. This is the special customized stamp, and at the bottom it says a Maravani teacher's sympathy with his pupil is exemplary. So anyway, that was just one of those kind of stories that you randomly come across. Um, and there's another one, and this is this is one that that even now makes me makes me smile. So imagine you're just you know you've spent days, you've spent all your life in Tehran or whatever else you've been, you know, subject to pollution. You've been um, subject to the pollution of the politics, and all of those things are just wearing you down day after day after day. So all of a sudden you sign up and you find yourself in. Hang on a second. A laughing class. Now, how would you, what would you expect? So first of all, I'm watching these people file in. I had tried to get to a laughing class for several trips to Iran because I'd heard about them and I thought, well, this might be interesting, who knows? So sure enough, you go in and all of these people who they had been, you know, dusted with an extra bit of dusting coming from one of the buses cruising uphill up Valias, you know, Valias Avenue was, you know, they just looked like they'd been done. They also looked like they had a well-practiced ability to keep quiet, not say anything, and also not express themselves particularly openly, certainly not in public. So imagine my surprise when this lady, Mahro Sameni, kind of takes control of this laughing class. And there are about 250 at that time anyway, um, laughing class instructors 
um, in Iran. And she literally starts out and she just like, one, two, one, two, three, ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Now, people just literally began, you just, every second you began to watch as their inhibitions fell away, as they began to think about other things. She, I mean, she explained, you know, that like a single minute of laughing is like 40 different breaths um, of air. Uh, there are 130 ways of laughing. And then she explained to this group, she's like, this changes our view of life, the pollution, the political problems, this helps, helps us forget all of that. And then most importantly, most importantly, she just told this class, she said, today, unfortunately, we forget the child within us. We need to find that and shut the rest of the brain down. And with that tactic, she literally convinced all of these Tehranis, you can see they're like absolutely into it and deep belly laughing. I mean, when this was done, everybody was like clutching their sides because they just couldn't, couldn't uh, you know, they couldn't believe what they were feeling in this class. So. Anyway, on that note, I shall leave it be. The amazing picture, and I know this is just a, just a few um, pages out of all the hundreds of albums that you can put together. I forgot to actually mention the name of the book, which is that is really after the uh, Green Revol Revolution, which is Let the Swords Encircle Me by Scott Peterson, which was published, I think, in 2010, I believe. Well, I, I invite, I have a couple of questions come through now. And as usual, um, you can use the chat line or the Q&A. And I think Aki will monitor any questions coming through the Facebook. So there are a couple of things. There are one or two salutations, greetings, perhaps, as you can expect from uh, friends who have uh, you have made over the decades and certainly through the Iranian community and um, one uh, question was which I flagged it up now where have I put it now um, was um, that if uh, gosh, I, I hope it's not been a play someone who said that I think in uh, Hotel Homo perhaps you might have shared a cup of tea or something but it said that at the time you thought that you just mentioned that Iranians perhaps were more fond of United States compared to many other countries in the region of the Middle East. But the questioner asks that um, you thought they had so much in common, uh, Iranians and Americans. Um, and he wonders, do you still hold that? Have they come any closer or have they moved away? Have they diverged? So yes. yeah, this actually, this is a really good question. And I've, I've written entire stories specifically about, in fact, I think one of the, one of my book chapters is specifically addressing this question about how similar Iranians and yeah. Americans are. And, you know, it's, but, but that's a separate question of like, like where they stand today. So Iranian, I would say that Iranians and Americans are similar in a lot of respects. I mean, this sense of exceptionalism that they both share. I mean, I remember one Iranian telling me it was fantastic. He's like, Iranians think they're meant to be, that they're just misplaced. They're meant to be in the middle of Europe. And someone put them out over here. I mean, you know, this kind of, and, and also this, so the sense of, of um, the sense of uh, spirituality mm. is another aspect. I mean, many Americans consider themselves to be to be very spiritual and as do of course many many um iranians in this um in this respect and also there is a degree of uh, you know i mean how to how to put this deftly i didn't actually even mention it using my own words in my iran book but i quote iranians speaking about how arrogant iranians and americans both are about their place in the world about how they think they can get things done and, and I'm trying to remember the direct quote that I actually use in the book, which is something, which is quoting an Iranian saying something like, you know, Westerners cannot even comprehend the, the, the level of, you know, the level of arrogance that, that Iranians have. It's something like that, but it's, it's more of a, it's more of a sense that, that there's a manifest destiny mm -hmm. that we as Iranians have, and mm -hmm. certainly Americans feel that. And the term manifest destiny is one that actually describes you know, this aspect of, of, you know, having a specific purpose. Um, so in that, you know, and, and all of those things completely still stand. I mean, one of the reasons why I think that, that, that the United, the U.S. 
Iran, um, you know, level of hostility has been so so vicious during all these years is partly because we do have those characteristics in in you know in um, in common. So mm-hmm. while it, it meant that we were supremely close when it was the Shah and the United States, it also meant that when we were enemies, being enemies was really important. Like who was going to give face first? Yeah. Who's going to give you know who's who's going to give up, or um, you know or or compromise or something like that and. And, um, you know, and that's, that's something that neither Americans nor Iranians can abide. And we're even seeing it now with this kind of game of chicken over who's going yeah. to return to the terms of the nuclear deal. Absolutely. So a very good question, which I had on my list, that is that would you say uh, that most Western journalists, by speaking mainly to the Western educated people of North Tehran, say, have given an incomplete picture <clears throat> of the public opinion in the West? This is also a great question. And I would actually say, when I mentioned earlier in this talk that, that up until 2009, I had a lot more access to people across the spectrum. But after 2009, after that, that um, you know, period of, period of, of real um, you know, kind of landmark change inside Iran, it became a lot more difficult to meet people who were, who were on the more conservative side, partly because, you know, the, you just the, the lines, the, the, the dividing lines, the dividing lines, which already were well established, became even deeper. They became chasms that took place. Now, one of the problems is that for foreign journalists, I mean, there are two kinds. There are kinds like me who have managed to get in, in my case, many, many times, and for as much as two and a half weeks, but sometimes for only five or seven days. Mm. So, look at the challenge. So look at the challenge of that. Like if you want to travel anywhere, all those trips, like, you know, you just, there's no time to see the people you need to see in Tehran and then get your visa extended, leaving your passport in Tehran while you go off to Zahadan or to Maravan or to somewhere else um, and do a trip. So, you know, so, so journalists that are allowed in for such a short time by definition are just you know, they really have the card stacked against them to start with, even if they have the best intentions. The other thing is, you know, Iran takes a lot of time to get to know, and it takes a lot of time to get to know people who will then tell you things. And, you know, even for journalists who've been based there for years, you know, they're actually, they're complaining, when I would visit, they're complaining that they have no access, because basically the first question anyone asks, if they call up an official or something, I'm like, when are you leaving? And if they say, well, I live here, like, they never get a call back. But I can always say, well, I am leaving on Tuesday, so if we don't meet by Monday afternoon, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So I would end up getting meetings that people who actually live there couldn't get. So, you know, it, it really, but, uh, you know, it is, it is a challenge. And I think our journalist job is to meet as many people across the, the spectrum as possible. But of course, it's much easier to speak to English speaking, party going Niavaranis who are invite you to the next, you know, sing song where everyone's getting, you know, getting drunk and having a good time. You're like, oh, wow, I, you know, I can blend with this but the you know but there's just so much more to iran and um and it really but it requires a lot of work and there are there are a number of journalists that that put that work in but um you know certainly anyone who knows iran recognizes the challenge Would of doing that. that i need for the next uh, two questions i'm going to combine i think you need your crystal ball uh one is that uh, you know the the change of uh, um uh, administration in the united states and the forthcoming elections in iran so one is, do you think under Biden, there will be a genuine rapprochement in, uh, with Iran? And could the clock be reset, um, read JCPOA? And the other side of your crystal ball, could you glance in it? And can you, do you have any thoughts on the possible outcomes of the Iranian um, presidential election? So <clears throat> on, the, on the JCPOA, I, both sides have indicated an interest in doing so. Um, and even, you know, Mohammad Javad Zarif, the foreign minister, has said that, you know, that certainly this can be orchestrated. Now, we haven't had as quick a movement on the U.S. side as I think a lot of people were expecting. So that is one that is definitely, you know, one of the challenges because there's a clock ticking. But the thing is, we don't know where it is clicking toward. You know, I mean, you hear that, for example, you know, more conservative or hardline factions inside Iran are interested in delaying, um, you know, interested in delaying a return to the JCPOA so that they can get credit for it. So they can then own this 
dynamic. I mean, they don't want to give Rouhani and and whichever centrist politician is going to going to be, um, you know, campaigning to be in the be the next president. They don't want him to get the credit for the work that um, that Zarif is and and uh, Rouhani have you know have done. So you know, so basically, this is a real hot potato. And of course, remember that those factions were very very much against the deal. Um, you know, as in the United States, you have the Republicans and, you know, and others who have been just dead set against it, as, as Trump illustrated. So, but the question is, is it going to move forward? That's a great question. First of all, they need to overcome this chicken and egg thing. Who's going to move first? Um, and, and, um, and then once that gets done, it's also a question of how the Americans will view, do they really think that somehow Iran is going to negotiate on their missiles or on other aspects which they've said they want to negotiate, are they going to say, let's get to the JCPOA first? Because at least there's a deal there with restrictions and that's the best starting point. And probably that's all that can be achieved um, right at the moment. But rapprochement, I mean, you know, we're, I don't know, they're just, both of these sides have absolutely demonstrated an ability to throw a hand grenade right down the hallway every time there's a possibility of rapprochement on the other side. So. It's just the one time it ever came together was for that nuclear deal. And it took years of excruciating negotiations. So that's one thing. The second thing going on to the presidential, presidential vote, it's hard to say. The conventional wisdom is that you know, conservatives will take over and that the Supreme Leader is interested in having a, you know, having a homogenous conservative and right wing um, structure, political structure in place, partly because obviously he himself is getting older and it's very possible that, um, you know, that the next president will, will be the president at the time that there is another broader, you know, broader change of the, of the Supreme Leader, possibly, who knows. On the other hand, I've also heard excellent analysis from people who know, who are real Hodi inside, who are saying, no, no, you know, don't discount the possibility of someone like Javed Zarif becoming a presidential candidate who is one of the few candidates if he were to run as a kind of centrist reformist who actually would probably mobilize people and kick them out of their disillusion. Because right at the moment, there are a lot of people who are not going to vote because they don't think it makes any difference. They think, you know, especially after 2009 that we cast our ballot and, and uh, you know, the results, aren't, the results aren't worthwhile. And so, you know, but if someone like Zarif runs, now Zarif has said repeatedly, I'm not going to run. Um, but you would never say never in Iran. I mean, what if the leader invites you to run? And one, th a couple of things just to remember on, on Zarif, which is something to keep in mind, because I've for years have thought, well, there's no chance because he spent half his life in the United States, educated there and all of that. And then someone who I spoke to said, well, no, you know, all that means is that he understands the enemy better than anybody to start with. Don't forget that he had a very close relationship with the Supreme Leader when the leader was president and Zarif was at the UN. And don't forget also that he gets a lot of points these days among the more conservative and hardline camp because he really defended like Iran's missiles at the European uh, Parliament. And also he had very close and cordial relations with um, Qasem Soleimani, the general yeah. killed by, Ooh, yeah. by uh, the United States a, a year ago, that, and, and that is gold dust as well. So, you know, Zarif has some things up his sleeves, but I, you know, honestly, I would never predict. One thing I know is that if I make a prediction, <laughs> it'll be wrong it would go. on Iran. Yeah, so uh, bringing it, making it a little more personal now is, uh, I'm going to combine three questions that are something that must preoccupy every foreign correspondent, that how do you deal with ensuring the safety of your contacts, your translators, etc.? Is is that something that weighs on your mind? And your own, do, are you aware when you are there, are the eyes and ears of the state on you? And adding a third element to that, that after all these trips, really getting to places that were, you know, many Iranians have never set foot in, has this Persianizing, Iranian, Iranianizing, a magic percolated down through your soul. Have you become a bit more Iranianized? <laughs> Answering them in reverse order, I would expect definitely having spent time in all of these remote Iranian places as well as across the politi political spectrum in Tehran and everywhere else, I have become much more aware, shall we say, and you know, and probably imbibed 
you know, aspects of, mm -hmm. uh, of Persian culture and that sort of thing. I mean, I'm sure it still shocks people when I like say, oh, thank you like this, which is something I have been doing for 20 years without even thinking about it. But of course, mm -hmm. I don't think that came from, you know, my time spent in Lebanon necessarily. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I think that there, there are things like that. And of course, I have a real appreciation um, for, you know, kind of the history. And, you know, I mean, I, I would never be able to give a talk like this and bring up the stories that I mentioned there if I myself wasn't interested, fascinated, in fact, by those different aspects of, you know, of Iranian culture and everything else. And remember, again, for an American journalist, this is like forbidden fruit because it's difficult to get in. Every single thing you write about Iran practically is counterintuitive for most of your readers, right? Because they have a two-dimensional, you know, kind of flag burners, terrorists. This is, this is the constant bleating that they hear from you know, from most media. So to get in and tell a different story, to find if, you know, people are amazed, like, wow, you mean in Iran? You know, I mean, you know, for example, I mean, just, just to give one quick example, I mean, you know, the story that I wrote about, um, you know, about uh, vasectomies and about birth yeah. control and things like that, when that was actually the government's, you know, the government's policy, it was extraordinary that like Iran had, you know, 15 years ago, won a United Nations population prize for its incredible, um, you know, steps it had taken in that regard, which, I mean, who would have thought that, right? I mean, now that policy is completely reversed, but there's so many aspects that are just, you know, that are just surprising. So um, to your second question coming back, and that is about the surveillance and that sort of thing. You know, from time to time, I have come back and found that my room has been gone through, um, you know, which is fair enough. Um, I myself have been actually very, very lucky. A lot of my colleagues haven't been. I mean, of course, we know about my friend and colleague, Jason Rezaian, who spent 544 days in Evan prison. Um, and there are many others like him who have spent time pointlessly for no reason because they themselves have been taken in anticipation of some kind of an exchange or, you know, or whatever. And those, those cases exist. And there's no doubt that if it wants to, um, you know, the establishment can impose all kinds of rules. And the way that they do it for people like me is they just don't give you a visa. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I'm watched. Actually, I want to be watched. I want them to hear my phone conversations. I want them to know where I'm going because all of that will tell them that this guy's behaving like a journalist because he's a journalist. And I want to be seen as a journalist. I mean, this piece that, you know, from Siasate Ruse, that I, that I quoted where they said I was, you know, some sort of agent. I mean, this sort of stuff comes up all the time. My file's full of that kind of stuff. I've actually even had the Islamic guidance ministry respond to some guy who wrote into them from Germany saying, oh, hello, we'll choose who's a spy and who isn't, thank you. Literally, I'm not kidding. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just par for the course when you're there. And for, as a journalist, you know, the beautiful thing about this job is one, you have a license to speak to everybody and two, no one is going to ask, you know, I mean, you know, no one's going to say, geez, why are you here? Because you're there to tell a story. And of course, now we have such a long track record. I mean, I'm sure, you know, with 45 visas, my files are full. And when they, when my, every time a visa would come up, people would say, oh, don't worry. Yes, we know, you know, Mr. Peterson very well. And then someone else is going to say, wait a minute, why do we know A. Scott Peterson so well, in fact, because that's a real you know, that's a real issue. But I mean, that's, it's the best protection is, is, uh, is openness. But I'm, of course, I'm watched, but you know, not in, not in the, the way that you would expect, only surveilled when we're really out in distant provinces, and we mm. catch someone's eye. Um, and then your first question about the people who I've worked with as researchers, I've worked with amazing people, many, many amazing people over many years. And in fact, here, I would love to just thank them all, because they have been so extraordinary. And without their ability to interpret their society without their deft handling um, when we might have been picked up. They're keeping their cool during a five hour long interrogation with, you know, Revolutionary Guard intelligence, for example, you know, and again, these are just things that come with a daily operating, um, you know, procedure, but they have been amazing. And I still obviously work with, you know, researchers and translators and and things like that. And um, so, but in keeping them safe, I mean, you know, they're also doing a job. They all, they often mm. don't want their names known necessarily, but, um, but if you're working officially and you're in Iran, then, you know, then they know, 
um, you know, who your official translator is. And of course they have to, you know, send in their reports and things, but um, yeah, no, we, I, I haven't had an issue of anyone being, as far as I know, being. Yeah. Being but as you can imagine, there are streams of thank you for this amazing talk. And amongst oh. them, there is saying that, you know, thank you so much for sharing such beautiful images and stories that, you know, somehow goes to rectify the unfortunate way that Iranians can be depicted, that often they're tainted mm. by the politics of the country. And also that uh, touching story of the child and the teacher in uh, Kurdistan, that how lovely to be reminded of that. There are the inevitable, I think you may need to reach for your crystal ball again, but the <laughs> inevitable question that, uh, you know, your thoughts on Nazanin Zarqari, that, you know, how could you please put that in some context? So, I, so Nazanin is one of those cases that just is so unfortunate and so unexpected, certainly to her. I mean, she just goes back for a family visit and now is locked in a system that is beyond her control, beyond her husband's control. And this is the case with so many of those who are held, especially dual citizens. Obviously, the Iranians don't, um, you know, the Iranians don't recognize dual citizenship when it comes to making arrests, things like this. And, you know, often, you know, it's extraordinary when you read the, when you read the memoirs of those who have spent a lot of time um, in interrogation or spent a lot of time in, in prison, because you begin to understand based on how their interrogations went, the kind of questions they're asking, the kind of phobias and things that are the focus of the intelligence and security sources. I mean, you know, several of the stories that I've written recently, I mean, as you know, just in, in um, very recently, we had the assassination of uh, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, who is, you know, was the guy that has never been allowed by Iran to speak to the IEEA. They requested this for years. The Israelis and the Americans consider him to be one of the crucial um, drivers of an actual weapons program up until 2003. So he was always going to be on the short list uh, for any kind of an, you know, an, an attempt like that. But what that did, the story that I wrote about that wasn't actually the fact that he, he ended up being killed, um, but that there was such an issue of leaks clearly within the intelligence and security services, they must have been shocked because this is a guy whose movements in theory should have been very carefully vetted. So on the one hand, the Iranians have a real issue with, with infiltrators, with agents in many, many different places. And this is demonstrated again and again. Their problem is that they then go after people who are low hanging fruit, who happen to be dual citizens, who, I mean, you know, we're dealing with like the Persian Wildlife Foundation. I mean, Nazanin, you know, looking at Jason, these are people who, you know, who nine times out of 10 actually are people who would normally give Iran and the Islamic Republic the benefit of the doubt, in fact, which is why they're living there or at least visiting. And yet they get picked up because hopefully they're going to be used in some kind of an exchange or because these guys really do think, and, you know, they really do think that, that um, you know, that these cameras that were placed up to, you know, photograph snow leopards and other things somehow were like tied to a, a missile thing. I mean, what's, ex you know, to a, to a missile base or something like that. I mean, you know, a couple of friends of mine years ago, I remember one of them, I think, got kicked out of the country. They were both resident. They both went on a holiday. Um, and little did they know, but the, the National Park Reserve that they went to was right next to a missile testing base. Now, they had no idea. And why would you care? I mean, satellites can take pictures yeah. of all these things. Yeah. But, you know, that was enough to get them, get them kicked out. So I just, you know, it's clearly dangerous. Iran has obviously got its, its antenna up very high, and it should, because it obviously has a big issue. But the people that get caught through it are the, you know, are, are you know, more often than not, just the, you know, just innocent. And that's, uh, and that's a real problem that obviously um, doesn't do them any favors in the uh, in international, in international opinion. I hope she is freed and that there's new charges that are meant to come up on Friday, mm -hmm. just disappear. But, um, you know, I wouldn't, I'm sure she's not holding her breath for that. So see what happens. No, absolutely. Um, a couple of questions, uh, I imagine, um, I brought up by the pictures that you showed on particularly Ahwa's uh, cemetery and, you know, references to Behesh Zahra, that um, someone asked that perhaps, and this is not, an, as far as I can tell by the name, not an Iranian person, that is it, could one say that the Iranian mentality rather, you know, romanticizes, I suppose, this idea of martyrdom, and there no, there's not the fear from death that we uh, generally assume. And it is, and it's sort of therefore 
it's an honor, it's a rather romantic um, action to take. And I could perhaps add, you know, another one to it, but would that put it in a different category of people? And I've thought when I was reading this question that you've not, uh, you, you've seen plenty of, uh, uh, you know, zest, zeal for fighting to the death, not just in Iran, no doubt in, um, in Iraq, no doubt in Somaliland, all the places that you have been. Is there a distinction, the sense of romanticized martyrdom that puts it in a different category in your experience? There's a huge difference. And that's a great, great question to ask <clears throat> because I wouldn't confuse a commitment to what many of these people who I've spoken to. And of course, this is, you know, it, the revolution itself used this narrative of Imam Hossein, or mm. of Imam Hossein, who of course died on the plains of Karbala in 680 AD. In fact, the title of my book, Let the Swords Encircle Me, yeah. is come comes from his very last words, right? So this is this is one of the most revered of the 12 Shia mar the, the 12 Shia Imams. And his example was one of resistance. Why? Because he was surrounded. Here's the story. And this is this is why it matters. And this is why it's also different from just willy nilly throwing yourself away in a suicide operation, which rarely happens, by the way, um, by Shia. You, I mean, for example, if you look at like all the in, in, in the thousands of suicide attacks, for example, that took place in Iraq over the last 15 years, I mean, not even a handful have been conducted by Shiites. Every single one of them been conducted by Sunnis. And they have a completely different mindset. Imam Hussein doesn't even feature for Sunnis. That's just a different way of looking at the world. But for Shia, and especially those who are the true believers in this in this faith. So the story with with uh, you know with uh, Imam Hussein mm -hmm. is that that he's surrounded by ten thousand you know of Yazid's um, soldiers. It's a hopeless situation against all odds. And he literally says he literally says you know if the religion of Muhammad will only survive with my death, then oh. And he like opens his tunic, let the swords encircle me. In other words, let me then be a martyr for this, uh, for this cause. So that whole story, which is so powerful, was co-opted by Ayatollah Khomeini, by Ayatollah Khamenei, by Rafsan Jani, by all of the decision makers in the early years of the revolution when the Iran-Iraq war started, because while Saddam was basically you know, invading Iran, they could say, you, your, you know, your um, uh, Imam, Imam Hussein has been waiting 14 centuries for your footsteps to come and defend. Now is your time. This is what we're waiting for. So the whole thing was couched in this narrative of a great divine against all the odds for religious purposes. And of course, that was very effective. And you see that today in the story I just told you about you know, mentioned about the um, Ahvazi uh, father and son. And this is not so uncommon, right? I mean, I have all kinds of pictures and time spent, you know, with people who really are true believers. Now, they aren't the majority in Iran. And in fact, many, many Iranians ran away from that war, escaped from Iran because they just couldn't stand it. And they can't abide this way of thinking. It's one of the big, you know, social, social divides because they're just like, wow, that's just too much. I, I, I don't want to cope with that kind of stuff. But anyway, so that glorification. So this, so Imam Hussein, of course, is called the Lord of the Martyrs. But that doesn't mean that martyrdom is the kind of thing that is what you're after necessarily. Like in other words, you know, the even even this even this man who I spoke to in Afaz, I mean, he gave me a quote. He just said, you know, I didn't understand what a beautiful fruit martyrdom was until I came so close to it. And these guys say they regret that they didn't actually die. But in fact, their purpose is to live so that they can then continue the fight and resist because the whole thing is about resistance against a greater, you know, a greater enemy or against all odds. And that mm -hmm. is a dynamic that's different from, you know, you're going to go to heaven if you, you know, if you, um, uh, you know, blow yourself up in a car and kill, kill the enemy. Exactly. Um, having traveled to so many other neighboring countries of Iran, what is your take on um, 
the perception of modern Iran in the region? Is it loathed? Are there alliances that are being forged behind the scenes and are forever probably shifting? What are your concerns about these regional dynamics? And what, what do you see? Do you think Iran sometimes plays a dangerous game when we look at Yemen, when we look at Iraq, when we look at Syria and beyond? Um, and it is, is, is there, is there a moment that you think, oh, for heaven's sake, you know, if only you wouldn't do that, or perhaps, no, this is, you know, it's been forever thus in that region. We just now see the big players much more openly. How do you well, read the region? So I, Iran? Th this is a great question. Um, you know, it's interesting because Iran, and there's no doubt about it, um, has expanded its influence and used this tactic, which is a totally asymmetric tactic, right? It doesn't have the aircraft carriers. It doesn't have the force projection, projection the kind of things that, that the Americans can move all around the world, that the Russians have demonstrated they can do in Syria and elsewhere. So what they do is they have marshaled these Shiite militias, mostly Shiite militias, in Iraq, um, where they've got all kinds of people. And then also they use them in Syria, they've used them in different places. Um, and, you know, and of course the, the, the model for this was the creation of Hezbollah with Iranian help back in 1982 during the Israeli invasion of Southern Lebanon. So that model is one that Iran has proven so effective at using, partly because it's been able to pay people, but what differentiates its ability to do that compared to say the Saudis, which have also tried to do that in Iraq or you know, somewhere else. The Saudis are bringing money to the table, but what the Iranians are bringing is they say, you're gonna be one of the fighters with us. You're part of the Shia brethren who are gonna be fighting for this broader aim. So Iran has really taken advantage of that. Now, you can argue that they've overreached. There are a lot of Iranians who have, when they protest, um, you know, and there've been all kinds of protests and especially economic protests over the last um, over the last couple of years, they've mm -hmm. left, you know, and, and people have said, why are you giving money to Lebanon? Why are you giving money to Syrians? Why are you giving money to Iraqis when we need it here at home more than anywhere else? You know, Iran has been very effective at doing that. But the way to, an to answer this question truly is that Iran's neighbors are always suspicious. They're always suspicious about what Iran is doing with that use of force. So, the Turks feel that way. The Iraqis, while they say and they, you know, while they credit Iran and and um, and uh, Soleimani for actually like quickly moving men and material to um, you know to Iraq to prevent ISIS from taking over even more of the country in 2014, um, while they credit them, Iran, if you can believe it, actually sent a bill to the Iraqi government when it was over for every single bullet. There wasn't a penny that was a gift. So they saved them, but they charged them for it too. And, you know, people are always wondering, well, wait a minute, you know, why this alliance? And Iranian diplomats often, you know, present this as like, well, we can be true friends and this and that. I mean, I don't think anyone on the receiving end sees it that way. They're always trying to be careful. And partly that's just because they're uncertain. Um, about what uh, Iran's, you know, ultimate aims are and, and that kind of thing. But I must say, you know, Iran, as of several years ago, I think we saw kind of the peak of Shia power projection, mm -hmm. literally in the last like thousand years, it was never as big and broad as this. And Iran made that happen. But now Hezbollah is under a lot of attack in Lebanon and they don't have very much money. And even their own people, I've spoken to Hezbollah fighters who are complaining all the time. I'm not going back to Syria to fight. They're just, you know, they're, they are tired and they mm -hmm. think that Iran, and even this morning I heard a report on seven more days of protests in Lebanon and you hear Lebanese complaining, well, Iran is, you know, has been backing the wrong people and we're not getting, you know, we're not getting help. Now in Syria, they've achieved a lot. And frankly, without Iran's militias, they never, Assad would, would almost certainly not be where he is today. So they kept that regime alive long enough for the Russians to come in and really bring in the air power to, to make a difference. And in Iraq, of course they're neighbors, but now Iran has a huge amount of influence, but we saw the Iranian consulates in Karbala and Najaf both attacked during the uh, protests a year and a half ago. So people are, and again, people are angry that another country is coming in and calling the shots. I think that's changing. I think Iran's kind of backing off a bit, partly because it doesn't have the resources, no. partly because it's having a, a recalibration 
um, you know, and that sort of thing. So this is, a, this is something that's always in flux, but, um, you know, open arms sometimes, but not often. No, I'm conscious that I've monopolized and I don't know whether Dina has any um, questions or not, but I know that I can't let this uh, conversation come to an end before they, they know that I don't know before I fire off my last one. Do you have any questions for? Well, I don't. It's been a wonderful talk, and it reminded me uh, of my time as a foreign correspondent a long time back. I used to work for Reuters. Ah, oh, great. Yeah. So, but it reminded me of uh, you know kind of working in the region. So. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. But yes, I was going to say that I can't, uh, we can't let you leave, Scott, until you tell us some adventures of rock climbing. Did it ever take place in Iran? I mean, all those of course. mountains, did they, did they draw you in? <laughs> so I, will t I will tell you a, an extraordinary experience that I have only experienced in Iran. Okay. And that was my only accidental free solo. Now, when you solo climb, that means you climb without a rope. <clears throat> so... I was climbing Torchal with some um, other climbers and it was just gonna be a day trip. It was snowing, everything was fine. These guys are really well experienced. And I've, I mean, I've, I've been climbing in Iran um, and in gyms, there are various gyms dotted around, um, dot, dotted around the places where I stay. And so I've climbed it like the oil ministry has a sports facility and there are other things that have, you know, great climbing things. And there are the mountains. So we went up for a long day hike one day and it was meant to just be a trail you know, a normal snowy winter sort of a trail. But at some point, the guys who I, that I was climbing with were, and, and this, was, this wasn't technical climbing, it's a hike, which should be no problem, right? And these guys decided, oh, look at there's a rock face over there. Let's just climb up that. That shouldn't be any trouble. So with no gear, with nothing else, we start to climb up this actual like rock face. And there were a lot of features. So it wasn't you know, it didn't appear to be too challenging, but I got about like 10 meters up, which was the point of no return on this thing that was easily <clears throat> 30 meters tall and realized that the rock now had been like encased in ice. So now it was incredibly dangerous, but there was no going back. So we shifted from an area that climbers call highballing, which means it's quite dangerous to then soloing, which means if you come off, you really aren't probably going to make it back down the mountain in one piece. So anyway, I got to the top. Finally, I mean, I was literally shaking because I realized that without a rope or any other protection, that this was just ridiculously dangerous. I got to the top. It was so exhilarating. It was so extraordinary. I'm never going to do it again in my life. Because if you've seen the film Free Solo, you know how that can be, right? And though that, that, you know, those guys are just a very special breed. But anyway, it was incredible. But that only happened in, in Iran, um, climbing there. And uh, that was my my one and only solo. Oh, wow, amazing. Well, of course, there was that absolute tragic accident of about, was it six weeks Oh, yeah. Ago, that terrible, terrible. Avalanche, which was uh, real veteran uh, climbers. And apparently, it was just some problem with the GPS. They were yeah. not yeah, No, no, terrible, terrible. Calamity. Tragedy. Anyway. Well, Are you a secret climber, Marcus? Well, sorry. Are you a secret climber? No, but but uh, I know I'm certainly no. I I am not. I'm quite a cowardly cowardly custard. I'm in a, a little Scottish Monroe is just about my limit. No, no, no. I'm very much <laughs> flat land. But Scott is. Um, I think we were just saying before you joined us, Dina, that if you know when he really pines for a battlefield and he can't get to one, he'll do extreme rock climbing. So I don't really like it. Well. Scott Peterson, it's been such a privilege and such a joy to have you. We've, as I mentioned, we've waited a long time uh, for you to be in London long enough <laughs> to join us. And it's Thank been you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And there are so many questions and uh, wonderful comments about your talk that I didn't have a chance to read. But I want to invite all our audience that do follow uh, uh, Scott Peterson. He has quite a active social media profile, especially the Twitter, and certainly on the Christian Science Monitor articles that are written repeatedly. And the beautiful photographs, do check out Scott's uh, own website. And I recommend the books. I'm definitely 
let the swords encircle me beautifully written. It is, it is, you know, there is pathos, there is excitement, there is a real holding a mirror up to that country. Thank you very much indeed. Do come back again soon. We're not going to let you <laughs> be away from us. For thank you time. so very much. It was a real pleasure to take Wonderful part in your Wonderful to have you. And thank you series. to our loyal audience on behalf of the Suez Middle East Institute, on behalf of Dina, Center for Palestinian Studies, on my own behalf, Center for Iranian Studies, and see you very soon. We've got a, perhaps maybe one more or two more talks. Do check out our website and stay safe. Wonderful to have you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.